Good afternoon, everybody. Um, Warren, are we ready to go? Ready to go. Okay. Well, I want to. My name is Desmond Schatz, and really, on behalf of you know the University of Florida Department of Pediatrics, the uh, Diabetes Institute, it's a great pleasure to welcome all of you here today to to really meet and to listen to my friend uh, Ken Moritzu. Uh, Ken is a friend and a colleague that I've known for over 20 years and um, has some very interesting lifetime experiences that he is going to share uh, with you. Now, I know many of you and I know all of you have really come to hear the speaker and not to hear me <laughs> doing the introduction. So if I had my own way and Ken had his own way, I would say, Ken, you know, I'm just introducing you just as my friend, but I, he deserves more than that. And I do want to tell you a little bit about uh, Rear Admiral Moritsugu, as I welcome he and his wife, Lisa, who's with us today, that Ken was the Surgeon General of the United States in 2002, and then again in 2006, until he retired from the Commissioned Corps of the United States Public Health Service in 2007. And he's a career officer, in the public health service serving for over 37 years um, and had previously before he became the Surgeon General had served as the Deputy Surgeon General of the United States uh, from 1998. But it's not just in medicine there um, as a Surgeon General, he had previously served as the Director of the Division of Medicine in the Bureau of Health Professions. He was the Director of the National Health Service Corps, the Assistant Bureau Director for Health Services and the Medical Director of the Federal Bureau of Prisons. I also really got to know Ken um, in the mid 2000s when he served as the Vice President for Global Education and Strategic Resources for uh, Johnson & Johnson, where he also served as the worldwide chairman of the Board for Diabetes. Subsequent to that, he, he worked uh, for the American Diabetes Association, where he sort of acted as the interim chief executive officer from 2019 through 2020. Uh, Ken was raised in Honolulu, in Hawaii. He got his, doc his uh, physician's degree from George Washington University and a master's of public health from the University of California in Berkeley. Um, in the 70s. He is board certified. He has many, many um, accolades and honorary degrees from many institutions, distinguished service medals from the US Public Health Service, the Department of Justice, the Uniform Service, and is an honorary member of the American Society of Transplant Surgeons, appealing to you guys in the back. Uh, the American Association of Physician uh, Assistants and the Honorary Fellow of the Association of Diabetes Care and Education Specialists. I regard Ken as incredibly knowledgeable. He has been, as I said, uh, a track record that shows leadership in so many areas, health delivery, managed care. He was involved with the pandemic influenza uh, response and even now the COVID response. But he has a special and personal message and expertise that he's going to deliver to you today in organ 
and tissue donation and transplantation. So please welcome me. Please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Moritsuko, who's going to talk about life trajectory of diabetes kidney failure and the need for organ donation and transplantation. Ken. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you for that generous welcome. Thank you for your interest in the tra life trajectory of diabetes and how it relates to organ donation and transplantation. Your presence today, both physically here and virtually those of you who are in Never Neverland uh, is a manifestation of your commitment and passion to helping and healing. Before I really begin, I wanna say thank you. Why do I wanna say thank you? Because you're involved in diabetes and I too am a person with type one diabetes. And so whether you're in clinical work, you're in research or you're in administration, you all are my lifeline. You all serve my needs. And I wanted to thank you at the outset. Also, I'd like to highlight the fact that Des inviting me here, it was really serendipitous because when I booked in today in April, it didn't really dawn on me that April is National Organ Donor month. So this is really very timely. Thank you so much. As you are aware, diabetes and its precursors continue to grow in our society. Two out of three individuals are either obese or overweight. Prediabetes is identified in more than 96 million Americans in our population of 330 million. And that's almost one in three people. Unchecked, prediabetes can progress to diabetes, requiring secondary preventive measures to avoid complications of the disease, including hypo and hyperglycemia, diabetic retinopathy, small and large nerve fiber damage, and irreversible changes to other organs, including the kidneys. Focusing on the kidneys for a moment, unchecked, diabetes could progress to chronic kidney failure, to the need for dialysis, and ultimately to the need for kidney transplantation. Similarly, one can de describe a life cycle for pancreas transplants, for type one diabetes, heart, liver, lungs, and so on. Hence, Organ transplantation is an integral part of the life trajectory of diabetes progression. Realizing this end stage phenomenon should drive our commitment to primary and secondary prevention and control of this chronic debilitating disease. In this light, I would like to focus the majority of my presentation on the need for organ transplantation and donation, the human aspect of curing and of caring for both the donor and the recipient. Several years ago, President Obama, in his proclamation declaring April as Donate Life Month, acknowledged those who gave organ, tissue, cornea, marrow so unselfishly. He stated, with quiet compassion and exceptional generosity, organ and tissue donors leave an indelible mark on the lives of countless Americans. Their selfless acts inspire hope at moments of profound need, and they recall the giving spirit that lies at the heart of our national character. There is a common thread that bonds us here together. 
today, in addition to our professional focus on diabetes. Some of us have received the life-giving, life-enhancing transplant of an organ. Others are awaiting their gift, their miracle, waiting for the gift, usually that of a stranger, to help them live. Some are the professionals who help bring together the resources and skills to make this miracle of transplantation happen. You surgeons and physicians, you nurses, physician assistants, counselors, transplant coordinators, researchers, and so many others. Some are the living donors, those brave heroes who gave of themselves a kidney or a portion of their liver so that others might benefit. Some are donor families who mourn in the loss of their loved ones, but take heart in knowing that in their dying, their generosity has left a living legacy in the bodies of others. But the common thread that bonds us here all together is this deep and personal appreciation of organ and tissue donation and transplantation as the final intervention for diabetes and kidney disease and kidney failure. Today, I'd like us to consider a medical problem affecting about 106,000 people right now. And the number of those affected continues unabated. Consider a medical problem from which 17 people die every day. That's nearly one every hour. Consider a medical problem for which there is a solution, for which there is no need for these people to die every day, for which there is no personal cost for those who are committed to its elimination, for which the reason fellow human beings are dying is because not enough people are willing to do something about it. Consider a medical problem that doesn't have to be. If we heard this dis description of a curable disorder, we'd wanna do something about it. That disorder is the need for organ and tissue transplantation and organ and tissue donation. But what does 106,000 people mean? Can any of us really picture these individuals? So let me give you a take home visual. Nobody recognizes where this is. And you can't read Florida on there. I'm pretty sure everyone recognizes this picture, the swamp, the home field for the University of Florida Gators. It has a capacity of just over 88,500 people. So just imagine this stadium as you are attending or watching a home game filled with individuals waiting for an organ transplant and about 20,000 more, about one quarter of that stadium waiting outside the gates, waiting for an organ to be donated so that they can get their transplant. Although last year in 2021, about 40,000 individuals were fortunate enough to receive an organ transplant, slightly, half, slightly less than half of that stadium. This represents only about 40% of those who are waiting. While on the average, about 110 people receive an organ transplant each day, this list continues. And on the average, that means a new patient is added to the waiting list for a solid organ every nine minutes. And of all of these, the 106,000 waiting, 90,000 are patients awaiting a kidney transplant, often because of end-stage renal disease as a complication of diabetes. So we could spend the time this, this morning, this afternoon, discussing various aspects of transplantation, surgical techniques, medical management of the recipient, extension of organ preservation while awaiting transplant, and a myriad of other topics but I don't wanna focus on these today. We hear cold statistics all the time. And I'm for one, 
do not believe in death by PowerPoint. What I'd like to discuss with you today is the other side of the transplant equation, the final common pathway without which transplantation cannot occur. And that is organ donation and the people who make it happen. My focus therefore is the human aspects of donation and transplantation. Hence, I'm addressing these comments to you, not only as physicians and surgeons, as nurses and physician assistants, as pharmacists, as students, as researchers or other health professionals, but to you as people, ordinary people of every walk of life who benefit from and who can give this gift of life. A brief history, organ transplantation is relatively young. The history of modern day transplantation dates back only a half a century to 1954, when Dr. Joe Murray performed the first successful kidney transplant between identical twin brothers. In 1967, Dr. Christian Barnard completed the first heart transplant. And in that same year, Dr. Tom Starzl had the first successful liver transplant. But over the years, despite attempts to create artificial organs, to clone organs, or to utilize organs from other species, what is still the rate limiting factor is the availability of organs to transplant. There are not enough families who have known what their loved ones wanted on their deaths. And hence, these families were unable to carry out the final wishes of their loved ones to be organ and tissue donors. This is a public health issue because it's an issue that affects all of us. Organ donation and transplantation are messages of hope because transplantation generally, as I've said, is the end of the line option available to people who have exhausted other ways to save their lives. In our great nation, we've brought organ transplantation out of the experimental into the community standard with people living fruitful, productive lives for years, if not decades. The one thing we lack is a sufficient number of organs to transplant and that is dependent on a sufficient number of people to consider becoming organ and tissue donors without whom nothing can happen. We're making some headway in reducing the waiting list. In fact, in the last year, there've been close to 14,000 deceased donors accompanied by 6,000 living donors. Science and the medical profession continue to improve outcomes with increasing survival post-transplant. But until science comes up with other options, individual organ donation will continue to be the rate limiting factor. We can and we must do something more than what we are doing. Organ and tissue donation is a very personal matter that touches people and is a far cry from merely the science and the technology of modern medicine. But in order to drive home how much what you do every day can make a life or death difference, let me try to personalize what it is that you do and put a human face to how you can make that difference. Consider two scenarios. You're driving back from a day of taking visiting relative sightseeing when your phone goes off. Your assistant informs you that there has been a terrible auto accident involving your wife. The trauma center has been trying to contact you. You immediately head to the hospital. A nurse ombudsman meets you as soon as you walk into the emergency room and identify yourself to the clerk. She escorts you to a small private room off to the side. The lighting is soft, the chairs are comfortable, and right now you need both. She informs you that your wife has been severely injured. There's been head trauma. The ER team is working on her and surgery 
and neurosurgery are involved. She offers you a beverage, access to a telephone, and invites you to remain in the room, assuring you that she will keep you informed. She returns periodically to advise you of what is happening. It's not good. The trauma surgeon steps in. The team has stabilized vital functions, but there has been severe head trauma. The neurosurgeon is with your wife. A chaplain arrives and offers comfort. The neurosurgeon now enters and describes what has happened. Your wife has sustained such severe head trauma that while her heart is still beating, she's lost blood flow to the brain. She's dead. The ER staff is cleansing her and you can see her very shortly. The doctor remains to answer questions and leaves you to your grief with your family who is now gathered. Shortly after, the nurse ombudsman returns again and escorts you to the trauma room to see your wife who has been cleansed from her injuries. It's a tragic moment. As you are later leaving her side, the neurosurgeon joins you, walks down the corridor with you and gently raises the question of what would you like to do? The memory of an earlier discussion between you and your wife returns. You both had decided to be organ donors on your deaths and had discussed this with each other. What would you do? Consider a second scenario. You're relaxing at home after dinner. It's late at night, the phone rings. It's a hospital. Your 22 year old daughter has been struck by a car and is being medevac by helicopter to the nearby trauma center. She'll arrive in about 20 minutes. You rush half dressed to your car and drive as carefully as you can in your shock to the trauma center about 15 minutes away. You arrive at the ER and go to the clerk's desk. Without looking at you, she brusquely states that she has no information about any young woman arriving by helicopter. You insist that this is the case, but still there is no information. Frustrated and frightened, you call your friend, the CEO of the hospital to request assistance. Shortly later, an ER nurse comes out to inform you that a Jane Doe is arriving, but she doesn't know if it's your daughter. You have to insist on someplace quiet to wait, please, not the busy and noisy ER waiting room. The ER nurse offers the police squad room where there are three office desks, office chairs, and a telephone. After uncountable minutes, you sense the beat of the helicopter blades and step out to find if this is your daughter. No one knows. Finally, an ER physician responds and states that a young woman has arrived with little information. The ER team is working on her. You push your way in and determine that the patient is in fact your daughter. You retreat to the police squad room to await further information. Your daughter has had severe closed head trauma and is transported to the ICU. You ask for access to a phone to call the rest of your family. The staff point you to the payphone in the middle of the busy hallway next to the elevator. And of course, you don't have any change for the phone. After pacing in the large open visiting room while the staff are continuing to work on your daughter, a clerk finally shows you to a small quiet room off the ICU where you could wait. They provide you continued access to your daughter, despite the limited visiting hours. Her brain is swelling in the cranial vault. The neurosurgeons are trying to reduce the swelling with medications, and you wait, watching the intracranial pressure rise. You request pastoral assistance. The staff state, but it's after hours. Can't you wait until the morning? when the staff will be here? No, 
and after a couple of hours, a chaplain arrives. The next day, the ICU head nurse comes into the small room and states, you got to move out. Another family has a child in the ICU, and they have more need of the room than you do. You're displaced again to the large, noisy waiting room. A television is continuing, continuously blurring the soap opera du jour. After making a few noises, they find you another room on another floor where you can rest and try to deal with your shock. You have now not slept for 48 hours. The ICP has now risen to critical and terminal limits. Death is inevitable. You now get moved back to the small room off the ICU because the other family no longer has need of it. Your ex-wife, your daughter's mother, arrives after an exhausting 16-hour flight from the middle of the Pacific. Less than two hours after she arrives, the neurosurgeon in the middle of the ICU informs her that it's time to declare your daughter dead. When she asks that she have a little bit more time, he tells her that he has been keeping her alive until she arrives. That evening, a brain flow study is done. The same neurosurgeon ob uh, approaches, obviously prepared to announce the results to you and to your family in the middle of the ICU. After you insist on moving to the small room for some privacy, he reluctantly agrees. He impatiently informs you that the daughter, your daughter's brain flow uh, studies confirm her death. Her mother asks if he would show her at the bedside the studies confirming her death. He states, it's not necessary. The brain flow study is confirmatory. And she asks, would you do this as a favor for a mother? He trounces off as if leading a pack of medical students and residents on rounds and proceeds pedantically to perform a bedside evaluation of brain function. It's consistent with brain death. He leaves. When the trauma fellow is summoned to provide the second finding of death, he states over the phone to the nursing station that it's not necessary because he accepts the neurosurgeon's determination. When told that the family wants to speak with him, he argues, I'm too busy to talk with the family. I have trauma to take care of. When he finally arrives in a flash of green scrubs and a white lab coat, at your request, he proceeds to repeat the neurological evaluation in your presence with obvious annoyance. He has other trauma to take care of. He has lives to save and your daughter is dead. Early on, realizing that your daughter might be an organ donor, you would ask that your regional organ procurement organization be called. They now arrive. What would you do now? These two scenarios with a little bit of editorial license actually happened. They actually happened to the same person. They both happened to me and to my family. My wife and daughter both died in separate automobile act, auto crashes four years apart, about 25 years ago. And I realized that this does not happen to everyone. In the first case, the staff had recognized that I was a physician and perhaps they provided me a bit more attention than usual. Perhaps there was a bit more uh, of professional courtesy involved. The patient was a spouse of a health professional. But in the second case also, I had been identified as a member of the board of the local OPO, a physician, an assistant surgeon general, and the CEO of the hospital was, and still is, a personal friend. I don't know how you may see this in terms of the two scenarios, but in the first instance, we, the family, had felt supported and comforted in our grief. And at the point of being asked whether we wanted to donate my wife's organs and tissues, we were ready to do so. In the second instance, we had already had the positive experience of donating organs once before. 
and we were favorably inclined. But as our time in the hospital went on and we interacted with staff, we became increasingly ne negative and agitated to the system and its people and the way we perceived they were treating us. Perhaps it was us who were, go who were getting more frustrated and angrier in our grief, but perhaps it was not. And in this instance, I would surmise, were we not already so strongly predisposed, we would have had a choice reply in response to a request for an organ donation. We all know of other scenarios, those we've heard of, those we've actually seen, and perhaps those we may act actually have been active participants in. These two scenarios are real because we all know that they happen every day, even today. And during the several days we spent in the intensive care unit until my daughter died, we observed more of the same. Ours was not an isolated experience. With all the effort we pour into raising organ donor awareness, it ultimately comes down to the moment of truth, the moment of decision, the moment of making the ask. And we can just about toss everything down the drain if we don't do a good job in this proximate peri-donation environment in better preparing the family for this moment. So, what is this peri-donation environment? It includes the environment itself, the physical and the interpersonal surrounding the crisis, the heroic efforts of trying to save a life, the tragedy of an untimely death, the confusion of the event, the fear of the uncertain and the unknown, the emotional turmoil of the family, the responsibility of such a permanent decision. And if in the second case, we had reacted with our emotions rather than with our heads, several people who could have been saved through the miracle of donation and transplantation would still be on the waiting list. Or even worse, they would have been dead, unsuccessfully waiting for an organ, which would not appear. So then, how does the real story Play out. 30 years ago, got my late wife, Donna Lee, died in a severe auto accident. We had talked long before about wanting to be organ donors when we died, and I had the privilege of carrying out her wishes. And a quarter of a century ago, because of that decision she had made, a marine biologist in Tampa, Florida, received a healthy heart a 35-year-old diabetic hospital custodian in Washington, D.C. received a pancreas and a kidney. A 12-year-old child who was on dialysis and failing in school received her other kidney. A retired school teacher in Pennsylvania received a fresh liver. A young woman in Baltimore, Maryland received one cornea and the other cornea provided new vision to a 49-year-old government worker. Donnelly was simply an ordinary person who accomplished extraordinary things. Without her generosity, as well as those of so many other donors, this would never have been possible. But that's not the end of the story. Because about four years later, my younger daughter, Vicki Leanne, who was only 22 years old at that time, was struck by an auto while crossing the street in Virginia. She suffered massive brain injury and died after three days. We believe she would have wanted to be an organ donor. And so we made those arrangements. Later, my older daughter, Erica said to me, dad, you know, we did the right thing because after Donna Lee had died, my two daughters had had several discussions about their own lives. They noted how so many others had benefited from Donna's final gift and how we, her family, had found such comfort in our loss through the donation. And Vicki had stated to her sister that she too wanted to be an organ donor. 
And because of Vicki, a mother of five children from upstate New York, received a heart and a new lease on life for herself and for her family. A widow with four children received her lung. A 59-year-old man from Washington, D.C., active with a local charity, received her liver. A widower with one daughter received one kidney. A married working father of several children received the other kidney. A 26-year-old man in Florida received one cornea, and a 60-year-old woman in Pennsylvania received the other. Put a face to the issue. Don't only talk numbers. Because of Donna Lee, and because of Vicki Leanne, and because of so many other organ and tissue donors whom we honor and acknowledge this month, many others have gained from a renewed life and an improved quality of life. We've come a long way since those two stories, nearly three decades ago. But I fear, despite our strides in understanding how donor families feel and behave and react, despite our experiences in knowing how best to approach a potential donor family, despite our best in intentions, we still have stories like this all too frequently. And in our failure to act, we fail to encourage and support those who can and will make a difference whether others will live. But when one hears about organ and tissue donation and transplantation, there is a sense that this is an issue that only affects a small number of people, the recipients alone but nothing can be farther from the truth. Like a pebble that's tossed into a pond, the ripples of life expand outwards, affecting not just the donors and the recipients, but their families, their friends, their colleagues, their coworkers and others. And these in turn affect so many others in ever expanding circles of life. Donation and transplantation affect society, not just one person, and we must make it happen. So consider what you can do individually and professionally to reduce the number of those dying. There are three basic messages today about the life trajectory of diabetes, kidney disease, and organ donation and transplantation. The first is prevention. We need to do more in primary prevention. It's better to prevent disease before it happens than to have to treat individuals after they get ill. And conditions like heart disease, obesity, diabetes, kidney disease are all for the most part preventable. Each of us can help prevent disease for our patients and for ourselves by encouraging healthy choices to avoid smoking and excessive alcohol, to eat right, to exercise regularly, to avoid toxins, to exercise road safety, and so forth. This is the first line of defense to assure that we all can live long and can fully enjoy a healthy life. Because what we do to ourselves today will have a, con will have a consequence to ourselves tomorrow. And when, despite the best efforts of our patients and ourselves, disease happens, we need to aggressively engage, engage in secondary prevention, the rapid initiation of treatment to stop the progress of disease or a handicapping disability. The second message is transplantation because failure of prevention will often lead to disease and for the need for transplantation. And the third mes message is donation because with all these advantage, ad advances, the rate limiting factor is organ donation. Those of you who are successful recipients have powerful personal stories, how a transplant renewed your lives and how as a result, you've been able to renew yourselves and to re-engage with society. There are some of you here and uh, out there who are waiting. You also have powerful personal stories as well. 
of a quest for health and life, of hope, of a human need. It is a public health issue. So what can hospitals and trauma centers, organ procurement organizations, and more importantly, the people involved, the leadership, the professionals, the staff do about this? It's very simple. Treat the patients and realize that the patient is not only the individual lying under the red blanket or lying on the ER gurney or in the ICU bed with tubes coming out of every orifice. It's also the individual standing around the bed, the family and the loved ones who are themselves traumatized in grief and in shock. Establish what I've referred to before is a positive peri-donation environment so that when the potential donor dies and the transplant coordinator, the designated requester, comes up to make the ask. The family and the loved ones are in as positive a frame of mind as possible, supported as much as possible during the deepest and darkest moments of their lives. Provide a warm and supportive physical environment. Provide appropriate physical and emotional support. In addition to the curing relationship, Establish a positive and caring relationship between the providers and the family and the loved ones. Communicate regularly and honestly and in the location of privacy and support. And exercise cultural sensitivity. But you say, we don't have the resources to accomplish this. We're all short staffed. We don't have the physical space. We don't have the time. We have more important things to do. And in these times of managed care, we have less and less of time and resources to do more and more. This is a really an unreasonable addition to an already full plate. Well, if that's your response, then we've lost the battle in this public health crisis. Because you consider the tremendous amount of resources we pour into saving the patient. You consider the tremendous cost of recovering donated organs. Consider the tremendous cost of transplanting the organs. Consider the cost of maintaining the successful transplant recipient. And in all of this, consider the tremendous benefit to society, to the several individuals who will benefit, and to the many more individuals who will also benefit from having that survivor live and be productive and a contributing member of his or her family, community, and society. And it's the right thing to do. In light of all these other efforts and expenses associated within the transplant system, this cost is insignificant when you consider what the returns will be. My plea to our health community is that in our zeal to improve the science, the technology, the allocation, the ischemic survival times and on and on, we don't lose sight of what we are all about. It's more than simply the clinical issues. It's the patient. If we lose sight of this human aspect, if we lose sight of the donor family as a patient, we may well have negated everything that we have done. I believe we need to better train and sensitize all the individuals who come in contact with the family. This includes all those who are involved in the health system, from the primary care physician, to the diabetologist, to the certified diabetes care and education specialist, from the trauma surgeon and physician, to the neurosurgeon and neurologist, to the nurses in the ER and the ICU, to the ward clerks and the receptionists, to the chaplains and the social workers, to the organ procurement and transplant coordinators, to everyone. Because everyone will have an impact on the family and how the family feels supported and how the family will respond.
Today, we've got new initiatives to increase organ donation and thereby organ transplantation. And we are making headway in reducing the waiting list. Over nearly two decades, the Tournament of Roses Parade in Pasadena, California has included a float representing organ and tissue donation and transplantation. The Rose Parade is one of the most watched broadcasts in the world and is a great way to increase awareness of the personal and societal benefits of organ and tissue donation and transplantation. I was privileged to be a writer on that first float. And 10 years ago, Donna Lee and Vicki Leanne were honored with fluorographs on the 10th float. A few years ago, the White House held a summit on organ donation. As part of that summit, numerous organizations and agencies made measurable pledges that would result in increasing organ donation. And I believe that we are seeing the benefits of that with the number of those waiting gradually reducing. The American Society of Transplant Surgeons hosted a Surgeon General's panel on organ donation at which six former Surgeons General opined before a packed auditorium of transplant surgeons on how best to increase organ donation. And the issue of organ donation and transplantation has found its way into our regular news program. When news programs report the tragedy of a life lost in an auto crash. Frequently, it's accompanied by a reference to the number of lives saved because the victim was an organ donor. And we've seen the previous increasing curve of those on the waiting list begin to dip. Organ donation is too important an issue for society. We dedicate countless resources to research, transplantation, recovery, and support of the recipient. And we need to dedicate resources to all the patients and to the individuals who will ultimately make donation happen. We should never more fail to acknowledge that increasing donation is more than a simple awareness more than simply signing donor cards, more than publicity campaigns. We should never more fail to care for the potential donor family as a critical step in increasing organ and tissue donation. And we should never more fail to remember that we are in a people profession, that we care for people, that donation is a people act, and that people make that decision. I've related this issue of donation and transplantation from one perspective, that of a donor family. But there are many other perspectives to consider as well, from the perspective of the transplant recipient and his or her family, from the perspective of the providers and so many others. So let me bring this all together. We've made great strides, great strides in modern medicine particularly over the past several years in increasing organ and tissue donation and in transplantation. But there is still a great gap between the availability of organs and the need. And we still haven't come far enough for the over 106,000 people who are waiting. 30 years ago, Donna Lee Moritzugu died and became an organ and tissue donor and it was the right thing to do. 25 years ago, Vicki Leanne Moritz who died and became an organ and tissue donor, and it was the right thing to do. Every day, someone dies who could be an organ donor. Every one of us can help make a difference. I applaud you for helping those who can heal to live. Thank you for curing. I encourage you to offer families whose loved ones have died the opportunity and the choice to make a gift of life for others. 
Thank you for caring. Thanks to all the members of our health community and of our community at large in whatever walk of life or vocation you're involved in. Help others share life. Consider organ and tissue donation for yourselves. Communicate with others about the need for organ donation to raise their awareness. Help us to identify best practices and then put them into action in your institutions, at your programs, in your communities. Because these are the gifts that make miracles. Help others share life through donation and transplantation. Share your life and share your decision because you have the power to make a difference. And that, my friends, my colleagues, my fellow human beings, that is the right thing to do. you for being our surgeon general thank you for your leadership thank you for your moving story thank you for your brilliant talk one of the truly i've heard the story before inspirational talks that i have been i have attended thank you for teaching us and for being the epitome of a role model so we're very grateful to you and to lisa for sharing your story and coming here today. I'd like to open this up for questions for Dr. Morrissey. Yes, Mark. Can I just follow on what you said? Again, most people are looking like we can be ambassador, ambassador, excuse me, for one cause, but you are too, I mean, for both diabetes and for organ transplantation. That was very inspirational. So I agree with you. It has been nice to see in the last three, four years as organ donor shortage has been a challenge. It was hard to get the numbers up, but then uh, unfortunately through tragedy like fentanyl and whatever, things are going up, which is a good thing in terms of beneficiaries, but what are your thoughts about the notion of opt-in versus opt-out? Meaning in, some, in European countries, they have the opt-out right. And I was hearing last week that a couple more countries are talking about this opt-out strategy. And if you want to explain that to people, great, sure. or I can do this. Stuff. Anyway, what do you think about opt-out? Well, let, let me uh, give a quick uh, resume about what the difference is. Um, in the United States, you need to opt in, meaning I opt in to be an organ donor on my death. In some European countries, it's an opt-out, meaning the assumption is you will be an organ donor unless you have made a conscious decision to opt out of being an organ donor. The question is, what's the role of opt-in versus opt-out in the United States? And my, my response to that is that it really is an issue of culture and it's an issue of environment. In some of the European countries that have adopted opting out, such as Spain, there is a very, very strong um, a culture of giving uh, and uh, of, uh, of, of donating. And because of that, from a cultural as well as a quote, political with a small p, word uh, that, that is uh, very well accepted. Here in the United States, on the other hand, I think our culture has been very independent, an independent culture where we are expected to be able to make decisions for ourselves about our lives and about what we would like to do after we die. And so while opting out would certainly help 
increase the number of organs that would be available. I'm, I would be concerned that where we are right now is that there would be a significant resistance to that kind of a policy. And with that resistance, my concern would that that would have a spillover in terms of the voluntary donation. So uh, putting it simply, culturally, I don't think we are at the point right now where opting out is ready for the United States. You're the expert, but you, I think your answer shows a lot of wisdom in that. We can't even agree in terms of vaccinations and we are tearing apart the seams of the country about something as simple as vaccination. Yeah, human organ donation. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Other comments or questions? Yes. Um, so say a, a loved one passes away and their organs are donated. Can family always find out where those organs go to to kind of give them that? Thank you. Thank you for asking that. Because I think that what your question really focuses on is the evolution of our science and the evolution of our art and science of medicine. Back when Lisa was an organ donor, uh, organ uh, procurer, uh, and 20, 30 years ago, there was this firewall set between the donor family and the recipient. And there were some of us who were donor families and recipients who said, well, wait a minute, we're being asked at, at, at the worst possible times of our lives to make a decision whether to donate or not to donate. And yet, after we've made that decision, we're being told, no, you don't have any right to choose who and how you'd like to communicate with the recipient family or the recipient family back to the donor family. And that's what I mean by an evolution, because over the last 20 years, that has gradually moved from no way to, well, maybe if both sides are interested in doing so, and the organ procurement organization plays the role of an intermediary, you can pass me a note and I'll pass it over, pass me the note back and I'll pass it over, to the point now where, uh, if both the donor family and the recipients want to meet, this becomes a media event and it is really celebrated. And so uh, the short answer to that is we've evolved a long way and I really embrace that and I endorse that because as a donor family member, some people want to know where the organs went, others, are satisfied in knowing it went to do some good. And individually, we ought to have that prerogative. Thank you. Yes. I have a, a difficult question uh, from something that we deal with quite often, which is as a society, uh, I feel like when sometimes when there's a, a tragic accident and the Medical examiner suspects foul play and they can call. They retain rights to that that body in the way in the eyes of justice is being predominantly important. And I I always struggle with this because I feel like the the impetus should be placed on preserving life as much as possible. That is the primary goal. So I just I'm curious about your your opinion on this and, and where you stand. On Thank you. Uh, and as, as anything in life, there is no clear yes and no answer. My response to your question in terms of what about the relationship between a transplant program and the medical examiner? And I think that that is really at the core of it. And that is that a medical examiner who is sensitive to, aware of, and embraces the concept of organ donation and organ transplantation can be, uh, can be brought into a discussion 
And while there are certain legal restrictions in terms of what a medical examiner can and cannot do, there can certainly be an understanding and a, uh, a, a, a reprioritization, if that's the word for it, in terms of whether or not uh, a medical examiner will, uh, will uh, take hours, if not days, in resolving a uh, medical question, a, a cause of death question, uh, as opposed to expediting that. Um, in my experience, there have been medical examiners and medical examiners, and some of those who were most, um, most expeditious in assisting the organ procurement organization in recovering organs were those who were literally brought in, not as an enemy, but as a partner in that decision. With regard to your more pointed question, is there something that we can do to get around the law, the medical requirement, uh, the law enforcement requirement? And unfortunately, the answer is, that is a balance that we as a society have got to set. And that I think is part of the legislative process. Thank you. Yes, sir. I just wanted to first say thank you very much for a very moving story. I, mean, I think that it really highlights the idea that we're all humans and we have relationships that will be affected by transplantation and death, whether we're a surgeon general or a general surgeon or whatnot. Um, you know, there, there are hundreds of, of models of transplantation in, in the hundreds of countries, and I don't think any one of them have really solved the idea that there aren't enough organs to go around. Um, you know, the only one I can think of, the only country that I can think of that does not have a wait list for a kidney transplant is Iran, where they pay people through the government to be donors. I don't think that that's a cultural possibility here, but I, you know, I imagine that, that and I hope that donation from humans for transplantation will be a, a brief period of time and then eventually we will solve the issue. But what do you think the challenges are in terms of in a, in a society such as ours to really um, allow there to be enough donors? I don't think it's an opt-in or an opt-out issue and I don't think that the paying people to donate organs is ever going to be a bit of a thing here. What do you think is going to be sort of what needs to happen for us to solve this problem? Well, um, great question. Um, I think that the solution to the availability of organs is predicated on what organ you're talking about. For example, uh, with 90,000 people waiting for kidneys, many, many, many people die waiting for a kidney. But I think that there has been an open, a door opening with living kidney donation, and not only one-to-one, -one, but even a domino uh, donation and transplantation, where one, two, and three, and four individuals are waiting for kidneys. Uh, the two of you will not match, but in, when you put the four of them together, you can contribute to, to her, you can contribute to you, and you to there. Uh, so I, I think from that perspective, um, Kidneys, there is a potential solution, but again, that gets back to uh, the balance between the risk to the donor and the benefit to the recipient. And I think that as we continue to progress and advance in our surgical techniques and post-surgical recovery period, that I think, and I hope, would be part of the solution to that availability. Um, similarly, with livers, although livers have been uh, a little behind uh, that that perspective, um, but I, you know, I, I think uh, when you when you look at it 10, 20 years ago, and where we are today, we have come a long way. Uh, obviously, you can't share a heart um, and and other organs. But with regard to uh, how we can actually solve it, uh, again, when you look at the number of people who die every day, not so much looking at living donation, 
but donation after cardiac death or donation after death. Um, there should be a large enough pool through that venue to be able to recover sufficient organs that would meet the need. We are not there yet, but that would definitely be one of those approaches short of opting in and opting out, but rather making certain that people are aware of what the need is and what they can contribute when they no longer have needs for their organs. Okay, is there I, a hand? Yes. Can I just uh, comment, because there's a question on the internet, which is really a follow-up to your question, that if people are prepared to accept the risk, what is the issue with being able to be paid for organ donation if it's life-saving and they may not need an extra kidney? Mm -hmm. That's the question. Okay, um, and let me address that. That, again, is an ethical issue, and I think that that needs to be worked through among the ethicists in our society. There are other, other comments that um, are, are arguing against paying or reimbursing for an organ donation because it can, it can um, minimize the altruism of a donated organ. And uh, there, there are several ethical positives as well as negatives to that. Uh, one, you know, one perspective is, you know, um, everyone in the organ donation transplant system benefits. The OPO benefits, the recipient benefits, the transplant program benefits, the hospital benefits. There's only one that does not benefit from a fiscal standpoint, and that's the donor and the donor family. So therein lies the debate, and it really is a debate, and I wish I had a simple answer, but I don't have that simple answer. Greater minds than mine are dealing with this on an ethical basis. Thank you. You had a question back here, comment. I'd like to point out to Dr. Alok that inspiration as well. Changing the subject a bit, you said you're a type one diabetic. Would you consider a pancreas transplant yourself? Would I consider a, tran a pancreas transplant? Um, I think that uh, given given the emerging science and the emerging uh, uh, evidence, I certainly would. I would I would consider a, uh, a I'm sorry an islet cell transplant as well assuming that the evidence was arguing for that, as opposed to the evidence arguing maybe or maybe not. So the short answer is yes, I would. Definitely. Thank you. Other questions or comments? And I, I don't mean to cut this off, but I noticed that we are over time and over budget. Uh, <laughs> so uh, to the extent that there are other questions, I'd be happy to respond to them. And uh, if not, uh, I will be around and uh, you can catch up with me personally. Back to you, Des. Thank you very much. Thank you. I swear that I, I want to be sensitive to your time as well. Of course, I really appreciate that. Okay. Yes, yes. Well, that was one of the reasons why when you had asked whether or not I would be willing to be interviewed again. Absolutely. But I would recommend afterwards because now you now understand. And yes, yes, that's great. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, that was unbelievable. Thank you. Spectacular. Thank you. 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 Nice to see you. Thank you very much. What uh, what is your special?
Oh, well, if that's the case, more power to you. More power to you. Here in Shands? I am, yes, I am. Uh -huh. That's fabulous. Very nice. Thank you. Very inspirational. Nice guys. Thank you. Thank you. So, Greg, you're telling your story, and I wish that all of you grew. Yeah. With all part of the training you're taught. So, it would be amazing. Thank this you. This is the transparent. Yeah, ah, that's right. great. Well, There's thank you for joining us here. My gosh, I mean, I didn't uh, uh, anticipate that transplants would, would would be here in the audience, and it's it's fabulous. Well, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
their type of impact, you know, do you still keep in touch with the people that their lives have changed? Or what does it mean to you to hear about all of the amazing work and amazing people that it's impacted? Yeah, well, uh, frankly, I am one of those families, and we are one of those donor families who were not so much interested or driven to find our recipients. Um, let's put it that we were satisfied and very uplifted in knowing that both Donna Lee and Vicki Lee Ann saved so many lives without really having to know who those people were. Um, and my, my, uh, my participation in programs like this help me as well as, as I send the message out. Because every time I tell the story, it reinforces for me that we did the right thing, that it's very uplifting and consoling to me, that although I still constantly remember my late wife, my late daughter, being able to tell their story helps me remember them in such great moments. It's extraordinary. I'm really moved by this. Um, is there anything else that you feel is important for people when they're watching later to take away? Um, well, the, the, the key in terms of organ donation or organ transplantation is that it doesn't cost anything to the donors. And if anything, it's such a huge reward to the donor families, knowing that out of the death of one, there is a living legacy. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. You're very welcome. Thank you. That was so Thank beautiful. You. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Thank so, you. do you go to different schools and you talk about this as well? Um, I have been uh, I've been the sort of a, a, a an ambassador of organ donation and transplantation, wow. uh, both internationally as well as nationally. Oh my gosh! And uh, I mean, particularly in the month of April. So donate life money. Right. Uh, there are a number of programs that invite me um, to come on over and, and do a presentation. Like uh, today is Monday, last mm -hmm. week on uh, Friday. I was in Lake Charles, Louisiana. Oh, wow. Where is Lake Charles, Louisiana? <laughs> you can't get there from any. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I, I flew out there and I flew back and I did a presentation for uh, donor families. Wow. And, and, and at uh, the hospital at Lake Charles, Louisiana. Mm -hmm. And again, it was very uplifting to, to know that so many other people who are donor families oftentimes are hungry, hungry <laughs> for the acknowledgement of their love. And, and that is one of my not so hidden agendas, which is to encourage organ procurement organizations not to do so, you know, to take the organs and run, but to recover the organs and realize that they need to continue to treat the patients who are standing around mm -hmm. the bedside, mm -hmm. as well as the patients who are lying. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time today. I really do. So well, thank you. And thank you for your <laughs> for your commitment. I, I said that before. Yeah. Well, thank you for your commitment to uh, to, to to extending you know, literally uh, two hours. <laughs> um, you know, uh, in, in Washington D.C., you know, you got a cameraman who comes in. So oh, I've got just... a two minute oh, no. two minute soundbite, and uh, they're here they and the gone. Door. Yeah. Yeah. I felt, yeah, I was learning so much throughout the presentation, so it was very intriguing and I appreciate it. Well, good. What's your name? Julianne. Julianne, do you have a card? Julianne? Yes, I do. Let me get that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah, Joanne. Of course. I believe you something to remember me. Wow. Oh my That's gosh. The Surgeon General's coin. Um, wow. Yeah, I need to get a different. Wow.
Wow, I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh, here, let me get the mic really Oh, close. yeah, you don't want me to walk and yeah. take the camera. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, we had uh, we have over a hundred people, fifty here, another fifty online. No kidding. And a lot of people are asking when we're gonna post, so they can like the ones that couldn't attend that were in clinics, they can watch later. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. Was great. Let's not forget to get your pen drive. That's right. Oh no, thank you. Kind of keep the message going. Of course, it's important.